Der er jo på dansk. Ja. 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 We'll be live in five seconds. Okay. I'm just waiting for uh, Mansi to come back, right? We're live. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Amrita Chaudhary, and I'm here today with uh, two very eminent uh, uh, women, and it's going to be a fantastic and fun-filled conversation. So we've got uh, Rupa Pai, author of multiple children's books, and Mansi Zaveri, uh, who's the founder of Kids Stop Press. So before we dive into our conversation, a little bit about our platform. Uh, today, you're seeing Winning Minds show, and this is a series of author conversations, uh, part of uh, Women Inspiring Network. And a Women Inspiring Network is really like, you know, it's a paid forward movement to bring together stories of uh, uh, women, women from different walks of life to inspire the next generation. So it's really a paid forward movement, which has in the, uh, since its start during uh, lockdown, uh, garnered about 10 million views in uh, just five months. And our aim through uh, Women Inspiring Network is to uh, create content and create com communities of uh, women from different walks of life. And as part of it, like, you know, I am the ambassador for uh, the Winning Mind series where I'm curating conversations with content creators uh, as an author. And like, you know, I wear multiple hats, but in my author hat, like, you know, I really love the written word and uh, I love like, you know, content in all shape and form. And uh, there are like, you know, so many brilliant women out there, authors, content creators in different formats and genres. And today we have moved from just the written word to the spoken word and to like a you know, performance and uh, blogs, blogs, like, you know, there's a variety of ways in which we can communicate what we are thinking about stories, about journeys, about like, you know, the world at large and communicate it to the people around us. And that's what we are hoping to unlock. So without any ado, um, let me first introduce uh, my speakers for today. Uh, we've got Rupa Pai, and she really doesn't need any introduction for uh, many of our listeners today, uh, because she is the author of 25 uh, books for children, which span everything from uh, like in a sci-fi and adventure fiction to uh, well, like, you know, we'll go through in depth in all her books, but like, you know, about the Gita and mythology and uh, Indian philosophy uh, and science. And uh, it all stems from her very interesting, uh, like, you know, part of being a computer engineer turned an author. And, uh, you know, uh, well, like, you know, so we'll learn a lot more about uh, your journey, Rupa, through the conversation. Look forward to having you here. Thank you. Looking forward to the conversation. And uh, we've got Mansi Zaveri, and Mansi is uh, the founder of Kids Up Press, uh, which is uh, like you know, it's a parenting blog, uh, which and a business like you know, uh, which has won multiple awards, and is a curator of um, um, you know information content brands like you know a lot of information, everything to do with parenting. It's your one stop portal for any information that you need about parenting, about children, about what to do with children, about how to be as like, you know, a mom and what to do and what not to do, right? And, uh, you know, Mansi's journey also has been very interesting. She started out in uh, advertising and branding and uh, took a year to start her own business, uh, which is the parenting blog. And it has been a fantastic journey, right? And it's really grown leaps and bounds through that uh, uh, since the time you started at Mansi. So wonderful to have you here as well. Yes, likewise. Thank you. Rupa, what will be common in both our journeys is you didn't know uh, that that people are going to recognize you so easily and you're going to be like a household name with, with mm -hmm. families for sure. And neither did I. I think that's the fun part about starting out is starting out because you believe in something and not, I don't think either of us foresee you know, or so that success uh, coming at all. <laughs> no, I think it's, it's, it's fantastic. So uh, uh, Rupa, let's uh, begin with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about your early journey, like, you know, what brought you into creative writing and like, you, know, you started out with a traditional career and from there you veered into creativity. So what was that decision like? What was uh, the journey? Actually, it was the other way around. I think I always wanted to be a writer. 
but the and the engineering was a detour because I came I come from Bangalore and uh, I came I mean I grew up in the in the 80s and late 70s and 80s and um, that was there were only two three options available for uh, kids who were right in science who didn't find science and maths difficult then you know come on you can't just be a writer and things you know that's something you can do without studying without work like you know this is what and it also came from a from my mom's belief that daughters her daughters and women in general must be professionally educated so they would be able to stand on their own feet financially and would never have to depend on anyone so she was very clear that you know you can go away and do what you like after you have a basic professional degree <laughs> which is why i went into engineering and but i mean i really consider myself one of the lucky ones who always knew uh, what gave her the most happiness and that was for me was just sitting with sitting and writing out my thoughts my really best way of expressing myself was through writing stuff and i have been doing it since i'm 8 since i was 8 years old so yeah so the engineering was the <laughs> was the detour was the beer <laughs> Yeah. Uh-huh. And uh like you know, so did you work as a computer engineer for a few years before you decided no, to No, no. No, okay. no, never. Actually, I just finished my engineering and gave my degree to my mom and I'm like, okay, bye. <laughs> I'm off <laughs> to try. Here's here's the degree you wanted me to have. I mean, not not to say that I haven't reaped the benefits of having that degree because I think oh, sure, sure. I think studying science, I mean, it sort of wires your brain in a certain way. It makes you more analytical and and that has also i mean you would think that that kind of skill may not be of much use in a creative profession but it is so these days i'm all for you know holistic kind of learning uh, liberal arts things like that where even art students are ex- humanities students of the humanities are exposed to science science students are exposed to humanities i think that's really important to have a balance of all this in your life yeah. i think it's a bit unfair to cut children off and ask them to choose when they are 16 which stream they want to go into and then cut them off from this if you choose humanities you cut off from the sciences entirely if you choose science it both are tragedies in the making no no i mean like i couldn't agree with you more like you know see from a business lens i can see that uh, you know what we talk about today is a t zone personality where you have the breadth you have a depth area but you certainly need like you know the breadth and the uh, like you know bringing in the analytics uh, side and the perceptive side of your brains together and you know, the creative yeah. side uh, together uh, yeah so could, couldn't agree more <laughs> uh rupa let's talk a little bit about uh, your uh, like uh, sorry uh, manchi let's talk a little bit about your journey uh, what inspired you to uh, start uh, kids stop press and also like you know, it's very interesting because there's a lot of people who blog right but there are very few uh, examples out there who've taken a blog and um, you know made it and transitioned it into a successful business right so what were the ingredients of really like you know taking the leap from being a blogger in chief to uh like a ceo of kids stop press uh you know so now that rupa mentioned that engineering was like a detour it just struck me that i think mera bhi kuch uh, you know aisa hi hal tha that you know i used to always write ever since uh, i learned write learned how to write i would always write a diary and my mom would always tell me why are you wasting so much time in writing who's going to read it who's going to read it and of course like you know i come from a family of four girls and you know a extremely uh, education focused family and one sister was a ca and an icwa and the other one was a company secretary and everybody was post graduate double post grad and i was telling my mom i'm studying only because you know you have to say that okay my fourth daughter did something right and <laughs> and i said okay mba school so i'm just going to do that and uh, um, and that's it i i did it i did advertising i did uh, branding lifestyle marketing all of that for 15 odd years but i think somewhere um it was just a detour like rupa said and you come back to what you're truly passionate about and what i realized is that i'm truly passionate about um i would i wouldn't say writing because i don't think i'm a great writer but about sharing stories because i think writing is a craft uh and i have a long way to go there but i think sharing stories is what i think is incredible sharing experiences and and uh, to say that you're absolutely right that a lot of people start out but the key to successful writing blogging or being in the same space is one following your niche there are so many people who first start out with okay i'm a food blogger then they move on to okay i am travel also i'm fashion also i'm and then the the ultimate word is lifestyle right 
you never stuck to your niche i never changed that title of being a parenting platform in the last 7 years of running kids stop press i never said i also do parenting and baby care and fashion and food and doing everything else i stuck to my niche so i think one was that second was being consistent um whether it was popping popping babies in between or writing from the delivery room or right you know resuming work the next day soon after i had my second child or um you know getting back and and getting back to my team after um, you know a, a close um in, in case of any emergency right it for me work was never work it was my happy place so i think if you develop that in no matter which profession you are in uh, i'm sure for rupa as well like if she's angry or she is irritable or whatever you just leave her with a pen and paper and her thoughts she's going to calm down and she's going to be fine right because that's her happy place so i think just making sure that you have that um is is uh, is is very very important in being successful and the last bit i would say is not uh, i was never afraid to fall i till date i am the i i i think i'm the most agile though i'm the oldest and the most agile team member um which is i'm constantly learning i'm constantly asking my team i'm constantly trying to learn something new so i think just a mix of all of these things um can make your passion into a huge uh profession and a successful one as well now well, that's fantastic can't agree more about like in you know, a persistence and following your like in you know, a following your path right like in you know, a following your uh like you know that one passion or that one niche area as you said like you know that's it's absolutely critical so uh you know that actually leads me into my next question very well uh which is about uh you know your focus at kids stop press and whether you look at it from the perspective of mothers only or do you look at it from the perspective of the child only how do you blend the two together how do you look at like you know the uh mother like you know uh, beyond the child like you know do you look at uh, the mom uh beyond parenting and i can look at uh issues of you know which are complementary to parenting right so i so i'll be honest at kids talk was we always focus on the parent um because the ultimate the first line of the consumer for me is the parent uh when we write on anything whether it is recommendations on children's books what to read how to get your kids to read or podcasts they should listen to or audio books they should listen to or whether it is about making sure in terms of nutrition nutrition fitness online schooling it's the for me i have always focused on the consumer and the primary consumer for me the primary consumer is the parent uh, and i would say um, not only the mother while of course um, a large part of it is still there is one primary parent in any household whether it's the mother or the father um in 95% of the households yes it is the mother but what we are seeing and you know when i started out say 7 years ago i would say maybe 95% of my audience was the woman uh today i brought that down to 75% women and 25% men um so yes we are seeing that uh that shift and it's always it's always the parent we're communicating because um children at least under the age of 12 are not some somebody that we want to target or speak to um and of course what is very very important is that we make content and discovery led content which is worth a parent's time so no matter how much time anybody has spent whether it's my social team or it is the the editors we make sure that there is only one filter if it is not worth 2 minutes of that consumer or the parents time it does not make the cut no matter who it is it's the editors it's the social team or it's our guest writers we have over 500 or the uh, writers contributing to kidstop press across the globe today it does not make the cut if it's not worth the parents time fantastic and thank you like you know, i stand corrected and i should have like you know said parent and not uh, mom <laughs> so uh you know because we're all like you know working mothers over here and uh, with uh, like you know multiple hats so obviously we need equal parenting in the household and i couldn't agree more right so uh rupa from your perspective like you know when you are writing like you know do you think of uh, the child only or do you think that sometimes the parent is also a reader and do you need to have a lens like you know that uh, um you know while you're writing that you need to cater to two audiences i'm actually not even thinking of the reader when i write uh, i'm 
I'm thinking of the child in me and what I would have liked to read and what I would have liked to say to that child. Uh, and I'm just enjoying the process of writing. I'm not really, really thinking about it at all. Whatever pours forth, that's what I'm writing, you know. Whatever I'm saying now is after the fact. When I look, look back in hindsight, I'll come up with, ah, this is what made me write this. But actually, as a creative person, it's it's just, I have, a, I have an idea. I want to put it out there. I think it would appeal to children. And I, I don't have parents. Definitely, I don't have parents in mind when I'm writing the book at all. <laughs> I'm only thinking of how to engage. I'm not thinking of children either. I'm just thinking of how to engage an intelligent being an intelligent reader who has space in him or her for fun, for, uh, I, I, I assume that they are uh, intelligent, they are curious, that anybody will open up if there is a good story to be told. It doesn't matter what the story is about. It doesn't matter whether it's fiction or nonfiction. So I try to speak in that conversational tone. And I usually write about things that I am myself excited about. And I hope to convey that excitement to the reader through my writing, through my words. So I'm not really thinking of who I'm writing for when I write. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's good to be in that bubble, right? Like, you know, yeah. then like, you know, yeah, you're not. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know how else to be. That's the thing. I have not ever... Uh, been anything we all, if, if I was to cut in, we all write for the idea and the insight. So yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, Rupa, I always have an insight that what's the problem I'm solving or what intrigued curiosity or what is somebody else struggling with the same insight and you're always trying to address the insight, I think, and yeah. the, the, the audience is after that. Is, is yeah. that the process as well? Yeah, like when I pick a subject and I have usually I pick a subject that I'm not very well versed in myself so then that joy of discovery that that aha that I'm that comes to me when I when I crack it or uh, and, I, and that I immediately want to share so this is a this is one of the things that whenever I find something that is exciting I share it so my family and my friends poor things are the First, they constantly, you know, um, bombarded with information like that I'm finding exciting. So if they call me and I'm working on something, there is no way they will not hear about it. And as I talk to people, whether it's family and they could be older people, my in-laws, my parents, my children, my uh, friends of, who are all of different ages. As I keep talking to them, I think there is much more clarity in my mind as to what grabs people, what people find interesting. It's all subconscious, but you get a feel for what people are reacting to and all that will go into my book. So, so you're blending an oral storytelling as your yes, sort of yes, like, you know, absolutely. like a, a process yes. of identifying what goes into the written yeah, book. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's definitely conversation. I don't think of it as, as a written word so much. And I hear that a lot from readers that it, it feels like we're having a conversation with you. It doesn't feel like you're, uh, you're, speaking from a pulpit or whatever it is so yeah and have you experimented rupa with uh, uh, like you know doing a podcast or like you know trying other genres i know you would have engaged a lot with uh, designers for some of your books mm, yes uh, but podcast i don't know i haven't uh, experimented with too many other forms actually this is my this is what i like to do i like to write i I, I do like to talk to people as well in my other life as a, a tour guide for uh, with Bangalore walks. I tell stories about history, about, and about mm -hmm. Bangalore and Karnataka's history to groups of students mainly. Even there, I work with children most, most of the time. So I do like storytelling, uh, but I haven't done it in a more formal way, in a more uh, digital way. I, I, I like the personal storytelling. So I do the speaking bits mostly personally. Sure. And live, and the writing is, yeah, yeah. yeah that's fantastic. So, uh, uh, like you know, Rupa, uh, um, from your uh, uh, like you know thing, shifting back to Mansi for a little bit. Yeah, uh, Mansi, you uh, are obviously publishing content from um, you know like the five hundred authors that you talked about, five hundred contributors, but they are across a variety of uh, formats, right? Like you know, you've got videos, you've got blogs, you've got uh, uh, podcasts. Right, and you mentioned you had recorded a podcast with Rupa. 
so how does it uh, work? Like, you know, what's the reaction that you're getting from different mediums and um, uh, what works well in certain uh, mediums? What kind of content works for certain mediums and what doesn't work for other mediums? Sorry, uh, that's a very, very interesting piece of the uh, question, right? Um, and I and what works well for written content, obviously, is um, what when we start Kids Top Press, we would start with, a, we started with a close to about 600, 700 words. I must say that today it's come down to close to about 300 words per piece, 300 to 500 at best. We do one or two long form pieces over the weekends, which are largely weekend reads. Uh, but besides that, um, so I'm saying even written has changed sure. so much. So it is, uh, it, that is one written form has also changed so much. Um, we see that on social media, people are reading more snackable content. Uh, so that is a completely different medium and it's extremely visual. So even articulating mm. your thoughts through graphics, illustrations, concising words, uh, is, is and concising through illustrations or, or you know, maybe four or five lines is again very, very important. Um, even telling stories through 20 to 100 characters is an art that Instagram taught us, where we share a lot of human stories of mothers, their birthing journeys, their, their uh, you know, their entrepreneurial ventures, etc. what we share on Kitsha Press on our Instagram feed. Again, as concise as 20 to 100 characters. When we talk of YouTube, we're talking of conversations in long form. People spend a lot more time on YouTube and it has to be, um, you know, strangely the videos that have done the best are the ones which we possibly invested least amount of time in. Uh, so okay. that is very, very strange. But I think the learning from there is that it has to be a very candid conversation that the person can relate to instantly. Uh, again, when you come to podcasts, uh, people are imagining you and they're connecting. They, you know, it's like listening to radio, right? You, you feel like, okay, this RJ must be looking like that or being like that or whatever. But what happens is that voice is kind of today compensated by a visual medium through social, right? Pele, you could only, you only knew how your radio job sounded like. Today, you can even follow them on Instagram and know how they look, feel, do, yeah. be, right? So it's, I feel that is an overdose of information and that makes it even more difficult to kind of create that suspense in each medium that you are on. But what is very interesting is that you create content for that medium. Don't assume you can just repurpose, slap, cut, you know, cut out the audio from the video, paste it there, whatever, whatever. No, if your podcast is not conversational, if it does not have those laughs, those giggles, those you know, literally like, a, you know, it's like coffee date with a friend, uh, if it's with two individuals, two adults, and if it's like hmm. a little more intriguing, if it's for children, if it's not that, it will not get you the kind of returns that you want. So you hmm. have to literally create for the medium that you are producing. If you are, like on YouTube, we have a thing called the three second rule uh, and the three second audition. If you don't capture your user's attention in those three seconds, you know that they're not going to watch through the video, right? And we're constantly monitoring analytics to check what's the dropout time. Is he dropping out at two minutes? Is he dropping out at two and a half minutes? So it's very important to also understand your analytics because you need to understand um, that will kind of define what should be the length of uh, the, the newer videos, et cetera, that you're producing. Uh, similarly for podcasts as well. But I would say each medium is very, very different. Uh, and, and you need to completely understand uh, your audience there and then create for that medium. Don't assume that you can cut, copy, paste or repurpose from another. Your thought process, your central thought process could be the same. So example, mm -hmm. if this one is on how to nurture children, the topic can be the same across the mediums, but the content may vary, the tonality may vary, the writing may completely vary. So it, it completely depends on, um, on that. And how large is your social media team for like, you know, like, or how we're, large we're is your production team? Very, we're actually a very, very small, nimble team. Our team is all of 10 people. And, uh, you know, with those 10 people, we've, but we've got 10 marathoners. Uh, so therefore, uh, it, it becomes a little easy because uh, we, we literally, we produce over 300 plus social natives in a month. 
So I don't know how they're doing it. I really don't. Uh, and uh, and like I said, I'm just hopping over from one place to the other. And uh, you know, it's it's a busy time for us, especially because a lot of kids are home. Parents are figuring out how to keep their kids busy and mm-hmm. and things like that. So it is a busy time for us. But um, but what we what we do is that every member is completely clued on to the process of creation. So sure. that makes it easy that no matter which medium you may choose. the ultimate aim and objective is is absolutely the same um amrita and rupa i'm going to take you a leave uh, and i wish you guys great content i'm going to come back to check out what rupa said <laughs> on the rest of the questions because there's a lot of curiosity on that um but thank you so much okay. for having me thank you thank you for being here mansi and uh, you know before you sign off if you could have like you know one in last inspiring message for our uh, like you know listeners today who would be young girls like you know hoping to get something uh like a, a message from you so uh it would be lovely guys just keep trying don't be afraid to fall fail uh when i started i had no idea what failure even meant uh and i always tell my girls uh, who are much much younger than all of you guys i they're all of 11 and 8 and i tell them that there is only uh success and learning there's no word called failure because if you didn't learn through that process then you wouldn't be able to get back to success again so don't don't worry too much don't overthink success uh, it it's a moving goal post every single day so just do your thing and have faith in what you're doing and just be consistent yeah thank you so much thank you thanks so much bye bye So Rupa, uh, you know, you uh, mentioned at the start that you always knew that you would write, but why children's fiction? Uh, actually, I, I obviously, as a child, I read a lot of children's fiction and uh, was deeply influenced, particularly by Enid Blyton. I've said this in many, many uh, interviews. She so totally lit up my childhood. She, her stories were always engaging. I could never get enough of her and. she wrote about and they were all they were always fiction right and uh, mm-hmm. but so many kinds of like there would be the circus stories there were the school stories there were the uh, fantasy stories and uh, what else and the adventure adventure stories mm-hmm. of course mm-hmm. the famous five and secret seven so i think that was something that i aspired to to be able to capture a child's imagination in that way but i didn't think of it I wanted to be a writer. What what I felt at that time was I wanted to be a writer. I didn't think I wanted to be a children's writer. I think until I was about thirteen or so, and I came across uh, Target magazine, which okay. the, the India Today group used to bring out at that time, and it was. And I I think so far no other Indian children's magazine has touched it in terms of the kind of content it produced, the kind of thoughtful. uh non fiction it produced it it was the kind of illustrations comic strips games i mean there was just such a host of things that uh, uh that was always available in target for any curious child and it satisfied every part of my brain the analytical part the creative part so it it was lovely and what i felt when i read target for the first time was that hey you know because you know i've said this in other interviews in the past but reading in it blighton so obsessively in my childhood what it led to was it made me feel that the only the only downside with reading so much blighton was that i grew up feeling that british children had a far better childhood than i did <laughs> because there weren't enough children's books with an indian ethos that i could read that that uh, talked about my story and my existence as fun so I, i mean it's so silly it sounds silly but sometimes these ideas have to be seeded into a child's head that you are having the best life if if this is not there then you get seduced by other people's stories and this happened that just happened to me a lot uh, of course i loved indian mythology amartya katha was a mainstay of my childhood as well mm-hmm. but again they were not talking about children like me they were not talking about yeah, the modern yeah, world yeah. it was the past glory of india so absolutely, while i loved absolutely. it yeah, it wasn't my story but when i read target magazine when i came across target before that children's world as well mm-hmm. target mm-hmm. somehow was so smart and so sassy it just caught my urban child imagination mm-hmm. to a great degree mm-hmm. and it had stories short stories of course because they were not books it was a magazine short stories about children who were living exactly my life in india with 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 so many relatives and cousins around all the time never going off on adventures on their own no that didn't happen in india 
not going to boarding schools you know staying at home and eating lemon rice and curd rice those kinds of kids they had stories about those kinds of kids but they all seemed to be having the most glorious fun the way it was presented uh and i suddenly that flip happened in my head and i said my god i how did i miss this that my life was so fun why did i need someone to tell it to me mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. uh but i needed someone to show me that your life is just as fun and i think that's when sort of the i i felt that man this is what i need to be doing to be writing for indian children indian stories for indian children so that they never feel again that another generation doesn't grow up feeling that somehow my culture my reality is not as fun or as attractive as someone else's yeah so i think that was the spur i think that's that's fantastic i think like you know we've all grown up i think there used to be chanda mama and yeah. champak right which were yeah. all different worlds like you know yeah. chanda mama was very fantasy oriented and champak yeah. was a lot of like you know like uh, kids um yes. animal stories and things like that which again like you know you can't associate with uh, yeah can you hold on a minute amrita it's it's really pouring here i just want sure. to shut the uh, because sure. the noise is very mm-hmm. loud yeah so i think while rupa is coming back uh, uh, i was just talking about the other books that used to be there at that point of time chanda mama champak there used to be another uh, periodical called nandan and i think it's amazing that all of them like you know they almost disappeared everything disappeared right for a while yeah. and then uh, there was a resurgence in a different way through uh, children's publishing that happened in the last decade or so absolutely absolutely yeah. yeah 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 and now like you know there are children's literary festivals there is like you know there's, there's a lot of focus back again on the child yeah. and uh, you know this uh, concept that you were talking about that you, you need to have uh, you need to spark the creativity of the child and the imagination yeah. of the child and not just like you know okay like you know, go and do mathematics yeah 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 sure of course yeah great so uh, tell us a little bit about the taranoth series and that's really exciting because you know it's an eight part series so uh, you know um, i say jk rolling always talks about like you know how harry potter emerged in her imagination all at once the entire story uh, so what was it about taranoth how did that emerge okay so taranoth uh, happened because my first editor from target magazine who I had completely lost touch with for several years came back into my life i had been away also i had been traveling i wasn't in bangalore i had i've been away for 12 years and i came back with two kids in tow you know and and then she got in touch with me out of the blue and said she had read one of my stories in a children's magazine and that that's exactly the tone she wanted she had just taken over as editorial director of children's books in a new publishing house uh, i mean the indian it was not a new publishing house but it was setting up shop in india for the first time called Heshet and uh, Vatsala uh, was my editor and she said you know uh, that's the tone i want in my children's books will you write some books for me and i'm like you know i have written stories of course that's i love to write but i've never take and you're saying books in plural what does that mean so she said yeah i'm thinking of a series and that was a huge challenge i didn't actually uh, think i could do it but uh, no um, the story didn't appear to me like you know it wasn't like that so it was it, it was in response to a request it was not that the story suddenly came into my head i wrote off a draft i sent it to publishers that was not how it worked it was was the other way around she said think about a story let's think of a story you know and at that time i was very deeply involved with as i am today but we had just started banglo walks which is this heritage uh, uh, walks and tours company and i and uh, we were taking children a, a lot to uh, and adults to uh, temples as part of the heritage heritage tours and i had done a lot of reading on hindu iconography and temple uh, iconography and things and what had fascinated me was something i had never known about that in the 11th century 10th century temples of belur and halebid in karnataka uh, those were the temples that we were taking people to there is a compass set into the ceiling carved into the ceiling and uh, the compass had you know you couldn't tell which direction was which unless you could recognize the eight guardians of the eight directions Okay. so if you knew which one that was either by the weapons he or she was carrying or the and the animal he or she was riding uh only then you would know okay it's that god and therefore that direction is that because he's the guardian of or she's the guardian of that direction and i thought that was a fa- because i was very clear whatever book i wrote it would have to be somehow it would have a deep undercurrent of indian mythology 
the creatures would not be gnomes and goblins and fairies. They would be something very Indian and drawn from our own uh, heritage and things like that. And so this seemed to me like, you know, when you say Ashtadik Palakas, the guardians of the eight directions, it sounds like all, oh God, old fashioned, that's fuddy daddy. But if you say guardians of the eight directions, it suddenly sounds very uh, hip for children. And uh, I said, okay, so that's, maybe we can create a series based on these uh, eight books with guardians of the eight directions, something like that. That was sort of the genesis of the idea. And I wanted to, I didn't want children, my protagonists to have magical powers. I wanted them to harness the powers of science and their own potential and, you know, to uh, things like, uh, you know, not so much magic, but mm -hmm. finding your own potential and living up to it. So that was the kind of, but it was all influenced by Indian philosophy and thinking. Uh, the story didn't come to me at a shot, but the structure did come to me at a shot because like I said, I think my engineering trained brain has to have structure. I can't function in vagueness. So I was like, okay, so there is, there are eight books and there are eight worlds. And maybe this will have something like 32 suns shining down on this fictitious world that a parallel universe that I created for the books. Uh, so the action all happens in a fictional universe called Mithya. And there are eight worlds there and Various, various. So the, it suddenly became a base eight thing for, for the math person in me. So everything became based on eight rather than mm -hmm. 10. Mm -hmm. And then I said, okay, so if there are eight books, then let's say there are four puzzles that these children, the protagonists, the Taranauts have to crack, in, which have been put there by that super villain. Okay, so they have to go after them and we'll have four riddles of puzzles per book. And then suddenly once, so that much I had, because, you know, I had always as a child enjoyed books in which the reader also gets drawn in because he or she has to solve puzzles or think independently mm -hmm. and then feel like one with the protagonist, you know. So that was that much structure I had. And then I began to write with no confidence that I'd be able to write eight books. You know, when, and once I finished the first book, I was like, I'm fully fictioned out. I mean, all my creativity is used <laughs> up in this book. How will I write another one? But it happened. Yeah. That's and it ended up being the girl. first, uh, India's first series for children in English. Yes. Yes, you know, like I, I remember, and I think I mentioned to you, I remember meeting Batsala at that point of time, because I was uh, like, you know, uh, my uh, book was coming out with Hachette at the, at around the same time, like, you know, uh, the second uh, author that uh, Hachette India published. So ah, I remember, okay. and like, you know, at that time, like, you know, she had mentioned, like, you know, how she was so focused on it, and it was going to transform, like, you know, uh, Indian yeah. literary scene. <laughs> uh, because there weren't too many people writing. There was uh, Puffin, uh, of course, right? And uh, yeah. a lot of yeah. like, you know, like uh, uh, work that used to happen was, uh, I mean, it was not this blend of contemporary and uh, like, yeah. you know, like uh, ancient yeah. as you've done, right? Like yeah. it wasn't, yeah, it, it wasn't new enough. Yeah, yeah. Right? So yeah. so what you did was like, you know, like it was fairly, uh, it was a new idea, a new concept. And, yeah, and, like, it know, fantastic. Was. yeah. But how did you craft like, you know, your, um, protagonist and your super villain. Yeah, so like that. I said, so somehow this, even though I have never, I had never read books on Indian philosophy at that time, all the Amar Sarikatha and the general watching of serials and conversations at home and just interest in history, which and was visiting temples to find out more for my own tours. So all this sort of blended, had blended in my head, I think. So basically, my thing was that there is no one who is all good or all evil. There cannot be. Because especially children, many children's books like to show uh, very black and white characters. They're the good guy. They, these are good guys. These are bad, very easy to identify. Uh, but I said no, because there's no, everybody, each of us has the potential to be a superhero or the supervillain. It's the choices that we make that makes us one or the other. So using that, and uh, as an allegory, I used, uh, the, there are two twin brothers. There is Shunya and there is Shah Pazur, and they're equally brilliant, equally courageous, equally in every way equals. They just make different kinds of decisions. When it comes to the forks in the road, each one makes a different kind of decision. One makes more selfish decisions, the other one puts the welfare of others before him. 
So at the time the novel opens, Shunya is the king, is the emperor of Mithya. He's ruling it. And Shapazur, because of bad behavior, has been consigned to a prison uh, in the deepest depths of Darya, the high security prison of Mithya. And at the beginning, when there's this big celebration ha happening to celebrate the Octoversary, which has to be an eight based thing, an Octoversary, to celebrate Shunya's coming to power, uh, to taking over as emperor, Shapazur escapes from his uh, watery prison and bursts onto the scene and then begins the whole adventure because he captures the 32 Tara sons that have come to dance at the celebration. And once he captures them, Mithya goes dark and then he delivers his thing. So that, so in the end, that, that's what I wanted to bring forth that with the supervillain and that he's also flawed, he's also flawed, but what really ensures uh, who is who becomes seen or as perceived as the good person is just the decisions that you make. They both have had the same opportunities as well. They've just chosen to walk. So that yeah. is one. About my own uh, young protagonists, the Taranots themselves. So there is Zwala, Zarpa, and Tufan. Each of them is a little strange uh, in their own uh, in their own mm -hmm. milieus. Uh, because one of them, Zwala, for instance, whenever she gets really upset about something, she gets really bright red, she starts radiating heat. And uh, that makes her a little unpopular among her friends because they think of her as weird. And uh, Zarpa is very athletic. Uh, she's also, uh, Zwala is very bright. She's the nerd. But again, I didn't want to show this stereotype. There are so many Western stereotypes, I think, that I sub subconsciously wanted to break. So Zwala is the nerd but she's also the one who's constantly combing her hair and wearing the high heels and, you know, dressing up. Because I wanted to say that the both can coexist in one person. It doesn't have to be the, the dumb blonde kind of thing. I really just wanted to break that kind of perception. Then uh, Zarpa is the sporty girl. She's very much into sport. And she's really the, uh, she's also a very, uh, very, very good uh, runner. But the problem with her is that when she takes part in a race at school or whatever, and she, she cannot keep to the lanes. When she really starts racing, she begins to cut the lanes and run like this. So that was Zarpa's uh, thing. And she also lists. She talks like this. So this is what made her a little, uh, she made, made her very shy because she was used to people mocking her or uh, sniggering at her. So that, that made her a little different among her gang. And then there was two, there is Tufan, who's the boy. And even he's the boy, but he's the one who's the animal whisperer. He's the one who's gentle and kind and, you know, far more uh, of, a, you know, with those whatever feminine characteristics. He has a lot of those uh, in him. And he's his superpower is that or, or he doesn't know it's a superpower at that time. His weirdness is that whenever he gets upset or stressed about something, he just starts breathing very hard, like all of us do shallow breaths when we're, uh, you know, uh, breathing hard and breathing shallow. But with him, what happens is when he does that, all the furniture in the room starts flying and people go bang into walls. And that makes him, everyone keeps away from him. So there are all these three sort of weird kids who happen to come to that big celebration at the top of Kailas. Kailas is the central mountain. And uh, when Shapazur bursts onto the scene and uh, kidnaps, and then they find the spotlight falling on them because Shunya and his Lieutenant Shakti uh, you know, the thing what I did in this book was I spelt the names very differently. Like you would expect Shakti would be spelt S-H-A-K-T-I. Uh -huh. But in my book, it is spelt S-H-U-K is the first name and T W E is the surname or whatever, okay. two names, Shakti. And most kids never connected the two. <laughs> the, you know, they called her Shukti. They thought it was a cool name. It was unusual. You know, it came from a different universe. <laughs> so... And so he, he speaks to her, he speaks to Shakti and uh, they both come together and they say, these are the three kids. They don't know it, but they're actually very special kids. So in that sense, I also wanted to convey to kids that, to readers, that just because somebody seems a little different from you, doesn't mean that they don't have some kind of superpower that you probably don't know about. And if you gave them a chance, they would show it to you. So all those little, little messages. So, and if you, for the, for the adults who ended up reading the books, they were like, oh my God, so Shunya, even Shunya is spelled S-H-O-O-N, first name, Y-A, second name. And Sharp Azur is S-H-A-A-P and A-Z-U-R, which you could think of as Asura and Sharp and everything put together, but it, 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 kids didn't get it. And even Zwala, Zarpa and Tufan, Zwala comes from Jwala, 
and mm. zarpa from sarpa and tub fun of course so there's a lot of undercurrent of india there is so many like they they had they drink a they drink a very stimulating brew called brunesca which comes from brew and nescafe like you know in my <laughs> and the food is all creposas which is like a crepe and a dosa combination and samchoris samosas and kachoris and the and the language that they use the language of mithya tara tang has a lot of indian language words mixed in with english language words so for instance a shape shifter is called a morpho roop uh, so you know so and the and kids just loved these words so that's how tara knots came to be it was all my ideas and fantasies in one book <laughs> in one series <laughs> it it sounds like it's absolutely fascinating and that uh, like you know it was also perhaps a time when marvel was seeing a resurgence around the world right through the franchise and the movies uh-huh. the whole marvel universe right yeah, 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 like yeah. You know, to some extent yeah. like you know the kids who were uh, you know getting into marvel universe could yeah. have an alternate yes. yeah. universe also yeah. to dive into right so yeah these, yeah fantastic so uh, like you, know, you talked a little bit about like you know, the structure and the crafting of the characters but talk a little bit about the tonality and the style of writing because you need to engage the children right like you know yeah. so there has to be humor adventure like you know, it needs to be simple but like you know like uh, funny so what was it like you know how did you uh, craft it yeah i think all children's books at least the way i write is i incorporate a lot of humor into it uh, but not 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 flippancy but a lot of fun dialogue just like mm-hmm. children mm-hmm. would interact with each other uh, and and lot of not taking yourself too seriously so it, even in the most crisis situation somebody cracks a joke and the atmosphere lightens and and as, as human beings we are capable of that it, it, we just may not do it many times but it's possible to lighten a situation just by changing your perspective towards it uh, so there's a lot of humor uh and there's there's a lot of action because this i wanted it to be like you know continuous action i find that i as a child enjoyed reading books that had like continuous action so i wanted this also to be a page turner in that way but it also has to have a lot of depth i think you know just because it's a children's story you can't say just action and ha ha he he and that will the kids will be satisfied i think children are also looking for a much something much deeper they want to connect with the with something the at the heart of the story not just be entertained they want mm-hmm. i think it ha- i mean there are books that are purely entertaining and nonsense kind of verse and rhyme which are also huge amounts of fun but i like to put in a little something that the kids will be left with to think about at the end of the day so and i always like to end my children's stories on a note of hope i don't like uh, yeah. children's stories to be too open ended or too uh despairing like they shouldn't end in a, in despair so these are my uh, things and and also i believe in using uh, language that even if it's a little above their regular the kind of language they understand use some nice words if you feel that the occasion warrants it that piece of uh, writing warrants it put it in there because always nice to leave it a little aspirational and children you know like for instance in the taranots books in the entire there's an entire universe right so the time time is different it's not like 24 hours it's like 48 dings in a thara day and then dings are divided into dinglings and then weeks are called octets and octons and you know years are called something so there are so many words so there's a little glossary at the beginning of the book <laughs> and when i had when i met children and their parents life it was always the parents who told me oh my god i had to keep going back to the glossary to understand what you were talking about not one child has ever told me that i didn't understand what you were saying by those words oh, sure, sure so children they just figured out it was a unit of time it doesn't matter mm-hmm. to the story children don't feel they have to be in control of a situation it's only the adults who want to control their worlds children are happy to be swept along with the tide you know so in that sense i think we should i definitely do not uh, underestimate my readers i think they have far more capability yeah and they're very perceptive beings right oh, like you know, we, very, we think very. of them as uh, okay You know, and they know pursue, very well when they... you're when you're trying to be condescending or you're not being respectful enough of their own abilities to understand the situation you're over explaining there's no need 
they get it at their yeah. hearts. They're all old souls. I, I truly believe that yeah, only their bodies are young, but their souls are old. So just one second. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Once. So, uh, it is from uh, fantasy and fiction and adventure, you moved into mythology, right? So you had Mahabharata, Gita, Upanishads, which are like you know like a very uh, typically dense, abstract, like you know very uh, at the esoteric uh, end of uh, Indian philosophy. And you've got uh, books for children on you know uh, on these topics. So. What was it like to um, a demystify this for children? What did you have to do? And like you know, if you look at like you know Mahabharata or the Gita, it's been retold. At least like you know those two have been retold by many many others, right? Like if you look at Vedas, Upanishads, or Krishna Devaraya, there'll be fewer books on those. So how did you make sure that your perspective or your uh, story telling of the story was different? Yeah. Uh, again, if you give me just a minute, I'm sorry, my dog yeah. is like, <laughs> one minute, I'll just. Yeah. So I think while you were waiting for Rupa to come back, I'm just hoping that you're having a, a fantastic time with my listening to her. Uh, it's, it's you know, such a uh, delight to dive into an author's mind to see how they are crafting their stories, to see how uh, she's actually like you know crafting her own words. And if you uh, if we look at some of the uh, very famous authors in the Western tradition, like you know we realize uh, how they had also like you know coined their own words and created the uh, alternate universes and created whole um, you know languages and um, like uh, tribes and whatnot. So this, uh, you know, part of being an author is being a creator, right? Uh, Rupa, I was just yeah. uh, filling in the words while you were gone. Yes, yes, so, I'm so uh, let's sorry. get back into <laughs> no, no, no. So uh, getting back into mythology yeah. now with you. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah. You would ask me that question, right? So actually, I haven't done any much. I haven't done much work on the Mahabharata. I have not written a retelling of the Mahabharata. But yes, the Gita and the Vedas and Upanishads. Mm. Again, uh, I hadn't, I, I, the idea of to write the Gita for Children didn't come from me. In fact, when the idea came from my editor, I myself had not ever read the Gita in its entirety at all. And I, in, in a, I don't know, in a hundred years, I wouldn't have thought of writing that for children. I had several other dozens of ideas of what I wanted to write for children, but this did not feature at all. But uh, Somehow, Vatsala, my editor, she, through the Taranaut's book, she had seen that I had a deep interest in Indian philosophy and mythology. I mean, she recognized it where I didn't. If somebody <laughs> asked me then, are you deeply interested in Indian mythology? I would have said, yes. Philosophy? No, I don't know Indian philosophy, I would have said. But she somehow gathered that you are, and that's why I'd like you to take a shot at this. And I'm like, really? Why would anybody write the Gita for children? Isn't it meant for old people? Why would anybody... Why would I want to torture children? This is not my scene. I don't write books like this. It's too deep. Basically, there was a lot of intimidation also. I said, it. I, mm -hmm. how? There are people who have been steeped for years in the study of the Gita, and they say they have only peeled a layer. So what gives me the credibility and you the courage to trust me with this kind of a project? You know, and uh, so, But somehow she was very clear that I know that it will speak to you if you pick it up and do it. And after resisting staunchly for six months, I finally took the plunge. I began to read with the help of an aunt who uh, who knew a little bit about it. So she lent me three of her favorite commentaries on the Gita and she was excited about it. And she sort of said, you know, I think you should really give it a shot. I don't know why you're resisting so much. So I said, okay, fine. And I began to read it and I was frankly mind blown. And I was like, this is such a fabulous text and why have I never read it? And it, it truly spoke to me. I mean, in the sense, there was a certain alignment I felt with what was being, what this 2,500 year old text was saying. I felt that, you know, the words were just so fresh. Uh, 
and somehow i felt that i had always thought this way about many things but this was validation that no no it is you know other people have thought this way too that this is how life should be or what just sort of it really, i don't know i don't know how to put it but i immediately felt that i must tell this story tell this uh, or relate this or pass it on to children as well and i could see instantly how it would also help children it definitely was not meant for only for people of a certain age or a certain religion or a certain country or or a certain generation it it's it was truly timeless and uh, now the challenge was how to do it because yes like you said it's been done so many times and once again because i had just got into it and read a variety of things i could see what worked for me and what did not and my other side as a children's writer knowing what works for children uh sort of helped me put it together so i i, I realized that not i don't know there must there might be books like but none of the books that i came across none of the commentaries storyfied that episode it was always shloka by shloka or it was always deeply at some philosophical level and when there were a few books bhagavad gita for children but they they just used simpler words but they didn't simplify the philosophy so again i couldn't see how children would be able to relate to that so i said okay i just have to put in an entirely new approach i mean it was very scary because the gita had not been dealt with like that so there was no precedent but i said you know this is how i feel about it so i'll write so in fact that particular book every chapter otherwise usually i finish the book and then send it to my editor uh-huh. but that book chapter by chapter i would send it to her for feedback and i would send it to my aunt who was you know i'd send it to three four people whose opinion i respect I said am i am i doing this okay am i getting too irreverent because one thing i was sure of was that while i could treat it lightly i could take some parts of it and be light with it this would i could never be irreverent with it i did not yeah. want to be you know definitely not uh, and i wanted to convey to the children the the beauty of that that it was an ancient text that never wanted them to lose sight of the fact that this was an ancient text so that's why i did two kinds of writing in the book the the first chapter like the one part of the chapter of every chapter is the actual what happened in the war and what what was being said and that's written in a more classical style of english and then the there are these gray pages what we used to call the gray pages like slightly different colored pages in between which are called lessons from the gita which take one pick one particular lesson from that chapter and then talk about it in very conversational language with the children of today mm-hmm. giving examples from their life about how they might apply that lesson sure. in their life so i think that balance worked well because uh, i didn't want it to be all in conversational style because i didn't want them to forget that this was a very ancient and revered text so it had to have sure. that kind of a little formal language for it and then but that is the book but how i talk to you about it is different so then it becomes conversation so we did we did various experiments and uh, yeah it came out quite well and then once that happened uh, of course vatsala said now 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 vedas and upanishad and i'm like no and i resisted that and i said i'm not going to be classified as that kind of writer i'm interested in so many other things and then i went off and did a book on economics and various you know a book on life skills for children and krishnadevaraya and then then the pull was too strong because i had explored that landscape it had been transformative for me myself just sure. researching that on many levels and uh, i did want to go back to the to the prequel like the gita is a distillation of the wisdom of the upanishads so i wanted to get into the upanishads and say what did vedavyasa leave out when he was creating the gita you know <laughs> distillation what else was written so that that curiosity was there and how did he condense all of that into this very sweet compact 700 verse text so then i went back and did the vedas and upanishads which again was illuminating and life changing and very beautiful <laughs> so enjoyed it very much <laughs> i can imagine like you know it's uh, uh i'm inspired now to go and read uh, your book on upanishads yeah <laughs> because that's should, one of those uh, like, you know, yeah yeah that those are books that i don't mind at all like even though it mm. might it doesn't seem like self promotion to me to say you must read it <laughs> you know because i think <laughs> it's not about what i have written but what i have been a channel for sure, uh, sure you know sure, so so when you're writing like you know like uh, how much uh, you mentioned that your engineering lens obviously comes into uh, structure so tell me a little bit about like you know how do you structure what is the process of writing like you know for you 
Okay, so like I said, I usually have some kind of structure. For instance, the my newest book is called uh, From Leeches to Slug Glue, 25 Explosive Ideas That Made and Are Making Modern Medicine. So it is a book on medicine and the history of medicine for children. And in that, the first thing I came up with was the subtitle, 25 mm -hmm. Explosive Ideas. So once I know that, then I know basically that there are 25 essays that have to be written in the book. So I divide it up that way. So <laughs> divide it into smaller tasks, you know, and then in 25 essays and the whole book may cannot be more than like 60, 70,000 words. Then you know how much each essay can be, each chapter can be. Then it becomes, uh, then each week you can write one or two, maybe one and a half chapters or whatever. And then I begin research. So if I talk about my nonfiction, there's a lot of research involved. Uh, the fiction, of course, is just sitting and thinking creatively, but uh, the nonfiction, then I have time, then I do like maybe one or two months of research first before mm -hmm. I begin to write a single word, I do the research. And mm -hmm. then I, uh, then I had to pick the 25 ideas because there are so many ideas in the sure. history of medicine. Sure. So sure. which 25 were the most important along this timeline? What makes for a good story? Mm -hmm. What gives it mm -hmm. a kind of logic mm -hmm. uh, and chronolo chronological continuation? Uh, you know, in today's climate of whatever the world is like, yeah. which, what things should be highlighted. For instance, for me, it was very important to highlight that whole, uh, the Islamic golden age, which was from uh, uh, Caliph Harun al-Rashid, so about 700, 800 AD to about 1300, 1400 AD. That whole uh, period in Indian, in uh, world history contributed so much to the advancement of medicine. And we never study about that. We only study about mm -hmm. Europe's contribution. Mm -hmm. uh, and India is some ancient Indian contribution, but yeah. nothing in between. Nobody yeah. talks about that. Uh -huh. And that, at that time, when Islam, Islam, when the Islamic empire was at the height of its, uh, you know, pro prowess in astronomy, uh, science, all kinds of science, medicine, they were a literature, they were architecture. They were way ahead of the rest of the world. At that time, all Europe was doing was going through its dark ages. And how quickly we have forgotten that the greatest libraries in the world, the House of Wisdom, was in uh, Babel, was in um, Baghdad. You know, so I wanted so those things, even though they may not be very important in the history of time, there might have been many more interesting. But I, I said no, we have to highlight that because those are things that have been forgotten. Uh, so things like that. So once I choose my twenty-five ideas. Then I'm set. Now I have a structure. I know first idea is the okay. second. Okay. Of course, it might still change while I'm writing. But once that is set, then I get to work. And uh, so again, like Mansi was saying, mine is also about discipline. I, you have to sit every day mm -hmm. and you have to work that many hours and you have to put in the time. That's how books get written and things get done. Work gets finished. Otherwise, it doesn't. So my um, formula is just to... Uh, time management and uh, discipline and a routine, a very, very strict routine of writing. So you're a morning person or are you an afternoon person? What's your writing day? Morning, 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 okay. not very okay. early in the morning. No, see, sure. so my sure. whole sure. life has, was always, at least in the, now my kids are grown up, but in the last 12 years that I've been writing books, uh, it, it, my whole clock is governed by their clock, which is the school clock. So sure. I would, they would leave by 8.30 or something. So I'd start writing around 9.30. And I had to finish writing by 3.30 because then they would be back. Sure, sure. So sure. it was a very, very good discipline, you know. So, and then because once they come back home, I don't want to be sitting and writing. Absolutely. Uh, I want to enjoy them. So that was how it worked. So that way it's a very good compartmentalization, you know. So now there's a lot of like, you know, like uh, uh, misconceptions sometimes that creativity requires a lack of uh, focus. It requires uh, sort of like, you know, being very amorphous. Yeah. But you know, if you yeah. see people who are successful in it, they are yeah. anything but amorphous, right? They are yeah. very structured, they're very disciplined, and they bring yeah. that. Every, to, every writer and every creative uh, person will yeah. tell you this. Like, you know, it's <laughs> just, a, I don't know when every creative person says this, I don't know how this misconception has come to be that you must wait for inspiration to strike. And I then so, I don't know where that comes from. <laughs> but are you a meticulous writer? Like, you know, do you go through multiple drafts or like, you know, you, uh, plan in advance so that you don't really go through too many drafts? How does that work? So I, I maybe I would have been able to know how I do this better if I was still writing longhand because then there are drafts and what. Now, since we write on computers, in a day I might have gone back and erased three paras, come back, whatever, you know. But once I finish a chapter, it's usually done. 
I don't revisit it. Uh, then I go on to the next. But while I'm in it, I keep changing and chopping and whatever. But once it's done, it's done. So I don't okay. rewrite entire drafts. No, I don't do sure, that. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. That's that's for Vatsala. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, she, I don't know. How to work like this. <laughs> uh, so I'm like, you know, looking uh, mindful of the clock, and I don't know where yes, the time yes. flew. Uh, so uh, let me, like, you know, uh, ask you a little bit, like, you know, about uh, if you were to advise young women who were looking at creative pursuits, right? Uh, what would your advice to them be? And would you uh, actually advise them to follow other careers and then come back to writing? What would your uh, advice be? I think it depends on each person and her circumstances. Like if, if there is a need for her to earn money, then surely sitting in a garret and writing, tapping out books will not be the thing. You know, if that is the kind of, if she wants to be a writer, then I would advise that you take a job within the same kind of field, perhaps as a journalist or work for a magazine. So you're still honing your, you're still doing writing, which makes you happy. Uh, but you're also earning uh, living out of it. And then I would advise that don't, then don't complain that I have no time for my own writing <laughs> because it's really a matter of discipline. It really yeah. is. So if you feel you don't have time for your personal writing because your work day is very long, then, I mean, any, any great enterprise uh, needs, requires asks for demands a sacrifice. So then you'll have to wake up earlier you, ha you can't party too late in the night. You have sure. to you know, go to bed, wake up early, write, do your personal writing, then go to work. So uh, it sounds so boring, uh, but really I think discipline and a routine and sticking, you know, sticking to something, trusting in the process, doing it day after day after day and not letting your baser instincts like laziness and sloth take over you know I, I, it, it seems like a very boring recipe for a good life but I I would I would recommend that you try it you know give it your very best shot whether it means waking up if you, if you want to if you, whatever it is you want to wake up and exercise each morning do it you know don't give up in, if you fail, start again. And I, am, I, I assure you <laughs> that if you keep it up for six months, whatever that routine is, whatever, just set yourself some kind of sankalpa, some covenant you make with yourself that this is what I'm going to do for myself. Could be something like I will stop putting junk into my body. You know, I'll treat it like a temple, whatever it is. And just sure. keep to it. And you will see that nobody will need to convince you after that. <laughs> so I think... Those are the things I would recommend uh, to to believe that you're bigger than you seem, to believe that you're more powerful, more relevant, mm -hmm. uh, like the scriptures tell us in the four Mahavakyas of the Upanishads, Aham Brahmasmi, I am God. I mean, I am that consciousness. I am all powerful. I am all seeing, which you are. We just don't reach in enough. We don't spend enough time with ourselves reflecting deeply on ourselves. And I, I would also suggest that it doesn't matter what work you do. Uh, this all this, you know, love what you do, do what you love is a very Western concept because not everybody has the choice to do what they love. Circumstances may not let you do what you love and you cannot always love what you do. But if you can keep a kind of equanimity that this is what I need to do, this is what I need to do if I want to earn a living. So I do it in my best possible, most cheerful way possible, because I know what, I know the reason I'm doing this. This is for this. If, if I don't see a reason for doing it, don't do it then. Find some other work, you know, but, but don't be in there and rail against the system and against your circumstances. And when you choose a job, try, try to know yourself really well before you pick a job so that you align, your job aligns with your nature. Don't go after a job because it's supposed to be prestigious or it's supposed to be cool or everyone says it's very trendy. That what aligns with you. You could be doing the most boring job, maybe school teacher. I, I mean, I'm not saying I would, I love to be a school teacher, but if, if in your opinion, uh, being a school teacher is very boring, having to deal with brats every day, whatever. But if that is the kind of thing that makes you joyful, do it because doing your job, whatever it is, that is how joy comes. Not from saying, 
uh, I this is my this is my passion in life. I will follow it and I'll be happy. Not everyone has a passion. I think the the passion is doing whatever you are doing with such great dedication and joy that the journey becomes the reward. There's no, yeah, <laughs> that is my. No, uh, beautiful words, uh, uh, Rupa, and I know that uh, you mean it, right? Because you're living that life of, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, right? yeah. of uh, as you said, Aham Brahmasmi and exploring, uh, showcasing your potential to the world, right? So yeah. That's, yeah, because uh, each of us is a God. We just have yeah. to find that divine in us and uh, align and, with and it. And how, how does, uh, like, you know, if you were to tell a message to uh, the Win Inspire uh, uh, listeners today, uh, of uh, how do they take themselves and like you know take this potential and make it meet the world? What would that message be? I think you have to you, you don't I mean don't have that goal that I want to make my potential reach the world. This, because when you this is the whole thing of Buddhism or of Hinduism or everything is like don't set don't work with expectations, do your work, whatever you're doing, do it as a sacrifice to the universe. I mean, if you can just think about, look, the sun rises each day and if he didn't, we'd all be doomed, but he does. And he doesn't ask each of us that, you know, that if you don't do 12 Surya Namaskars for me, I will not rise. Mm -hmm. You know, he does it because it's his dharma. It is, it is the nature of the sun to rise and it is what his, his responsibility. So he does it. And if each of us can treat our work, whether at home, as moms or daughters-in-law or sisters or wives, uh, in the, or as employees or employers, with that same kind of dispassion that I do it because I must, and not because I love it and not because I hate it, but because it is my duty to do it and it is in my nature to do it and it's my responsibility to do it. So if you work like that, saying that I have so much already given to me on a platter from this world, just in, just the trees outside my window and you know the fact that I am healthy in the middle of this COVID pandemic. So if you can think like that and say, just for this, I will also show gratitude by giving my work as a sacrifice and offering it to the world with no expectations, uh, except I will work with joy. That's all. And my joy will radiate out and make many other people joyful. And success and all that are all man-made things. But if you can access joy within yourself and peace and contentment, that you'll be the happiest person, most successful, most powerful person in the world. Fantastic, Rupa. I think like, you know, on that message of joy, thank you so much. Thank you. It's uh, really been wonderful having you here and uh, wish you... Thank you, Amrita. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.